Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. Welcome to our new television series, World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Our organization is a leading forum for global education and international affairs. Through comprehensive public service programs for students, teachers, and the interested public, the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. is a place where learning happens. Today's program will feature Nobel laureate Dr. Joseph Stiglitz, speaking on global economic challenges and solutions. During the next 13 weeks, we will present such distinguished guests as William Perry, a former Secretary of Defense, and Stephen Hadley, a former National Security Advisor. Dr. James Zugby, noted author and Middle East expert. John Hoffmeister, the former President of Shell Oil. And Ambassador Akbar Ahmed and Dr. Bernard Lewis, two of the world's leading scholars on Islam. Please enjoy our weekly programs on important topics of global interest to Americans and the international community. Thanks for joining us on the premier edition of World Affairs Today. Welcome to the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C.'s Distinguished Speaker Program with Dr. Joseph Stiglitz and the Honorable Roel Campos. My name is Heidi Schuth, and I serve as president of the World Affairs Council. And on behalf of the board of directors and members, it is my pleasure to, to introduce today's program. We are delighted to host Dr. Stiglitz, Nobel Prize winning economist, professor, and best-selling author. Dr. Stiglitz will be introduced by Roel Campos. He is senior resident partner with the Washington law firm of Cooley Godward Cronish. From 2002 until 2007, Mr. Campos served as commissioner of the Securities and Exchange Commission. He served as the Commission's liaison to the international regulatory community, where he was known as one of the best regulators in the world. He has presided over hundreds of complex enforcement cases and participated in the crafting and adoption of the major SEC regulatory initiatives, including the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, mutual fund governance and compliance rules, the new national market system, and the internationalization of the securities market. He was recently named to President Barack Obama's Presidential Intelligence Advisory Board. Prior to service on the SEC, Mr. Campos served as a federal prosecutor in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Los Angeles, where he successfully prosecuted complex and violent narcotics cartels, and in a celebrated trial, convicted defendants for the kidnapping and murder of a DEA agent. Mr. Campos is a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy and earned his Juris Doctorate from Harvard Law School in 1979. He is also a member of the Board of Directors of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Honorable Roel Campos. Thank you, Heidi. That was uh, very nice. You went way more into my background than you needed to, because um, uh, first, it's not that interesting, and we have uh, a tremendous guest today. Uh, this, this, this individual, Dr. Stiglitz, needs very, very little introduction. I was thinking kind of how to put him in the pantheon of uh, celebrity that we, we have today in our you know, celebrity conscious culture. You know, and I, you know, calling him a rock star maybe doesn't give him enough, uh, you know, status or something. But, you know, those of us who grew up in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, you know, a rock star was about as high as you got. And, uh, and I guess he could be likened to a Mick Jagger or to Paul McCartney or somebody like that in terms of truly at the top uh, of his profession, of his, uh, and, and beyond that, uh, beyond just being a... a someone who's at the top of the profession. He is a thought leader, a uh, provocateur, you know, uh, pushing people beyond the envelope. So uh, just a few details, I think, uh, will be more than enough uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Joseph Stiglitz. Uh, 
Uh, obviously, he's an economist uh, and a very famous one. Uh, he's currently a professor at Columbia University. Uh, as Heidi said, he uh, received the Nobel Prize. Did you know it was called the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences in 2001 uh, for something, if I recall correctly, called asymmetric information and his studies and advancement in that area. He's also received uh, the John Bates Clark Medal in 1979. Uh, he's held uh, a number of uh, policy positions in government. Uh, he served on President Bill Clinton's team and was chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. He was also the former senior uh, vice president and chief economist of the World Bank and um, uh, is, is widely known uh, for his writings and his uh, very frank views. Uh, I, I feel like asking him uh, whether he has any friends left uh, based on, <laughs> uh, on his equally uh, tough criticism, tough love, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll phrase it that way, that he gives out to, uh, to everyone. Um, uh, you know, uh, we'll, to, 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 you know, he's, um, I, I could go on and on, he's, he's got all kinds of policy uh, groups that he's worked out, uh, and uh, he's, you know, he's certainly a star and, and makes Columbia University uh, one of the distinguished um, and, and famous institutions that it is. Um, just quickly, you know, you may know that uh, he went to Amherst College, uh, he got his PhD from MIT and uh, has been ongoing uh, and, and going forward ever since. Uh, so, again, we're extremely fortunate. It's, it's uh, one, I read somewhere that, that Dr. Stiglitz may be the most referred to and referenced economist in the world. You know, in other words, you're more likely to run into a site or a quote or something from him uh, than almost any other economist, which is, again, saying a lot, which, again, puts me back to his rock status. Uh, so we're going to do things a little bit differently today. We we uh, we, we thought, you know, in, certain, in terms of luring here, that we didn't want him to necessarily have to prepare a speech, and uh, although that would have been uh, exciting in, in and of itself, the format that we're going to do today is I'm going to have the privilege of asking uh, Dr. Stiglitz different questions, and in particular, we want to cover some of the items. He's going to give us some teasers of the material that's in his, uh, one of his latest books, Free Fall. He writes so many that I'm not sure he's got a, an even more current book, but that's the book that uh, we're, we're gonna be dealing with today. Uh, and hopefully it'll go well. What, 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 I, what I'll be trying to do is sort of begin, you know, before we get to the good stuff, you know, uh, about what's going on today and, and whether the government and the policies are a good idea and what he would do. I wanna go back a little bit further and uh, sort of talk and, and set up the framework of what I see uh, as, as some of the clashes in theory, believe it or not, which I find very interesting, I think you will too, that exist today and around the world. And, and depending on your perspective and your view of economics, uh, that will determine your policies and what you think of what is going on in the world today. And so Dr. Stieglitz hopefully will, will share some of his uh, very, very learn, learned thoughts about those areas. So first of all, could, could you give us your sense of uh, the role of economists and economics today? Is it, a, is it a classical science? I mean, if you think back and if you think of Einstein as sort of the, the <laughs> classic scientist, right? When he came up with his special theory of relativity, as I remember, he also came up with an experiment, you know, where he said, you know, if this experiment works, I'm right. If it doesn't, I'm wrong. And I'll go back to the drawing board. Do we, is economics lend itself to that sort of uh, approach? Well, no, economics uh, is not like a natural science where you can have controlled experiments, although there are some instances there are, the, the economists do, in some very narrow circumstances, do controlled experiments. But particularly when you're dealing with what we call macroeconomics, how the whole economy works, uh, you don't have those natural experiments. So typically you, you have the problem of trying to interpret uh, historical data. So uh, there are events, there are, uh, for instance, lots of uh, crises. Governments do certain things. You try to interpret. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. 
And the problem is that there is so much going on that it's often difficult to cleanly distinguish alternative hypotheses. Um, so the consequence of this is that uh, there are many strong beliefs that economists have that don't aren't anywhere like relativity theory where almost all physicists or all physicists would agree on that. Let me, let me give you a, 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 though, a, um, another aspect of this. Um, probably the most important idea in economics is Adam Smith's invisible hand uh, that was written in seven, The Wealth of Nations, 1776. Uh, and Adam Smith said that the pursuit of self-interest leagues the economy uh, as if by an invisible hand to the well-being of everybody in society. So it's not like the, the firms maximizing their profits intend to lead to society's well-being, but doing that indirectly leads to society's well-being. Well, that was a conjecture, an interesting one. You might say, we know it's not true at this point. I don't think anybody thinks that uh, the financial sector's pursuit of greed led to the well-being of the global society. Uh, that it obviously led to a lot of turmoil. Now people are losing jobs, homes. Something went wrong. Well, that leads to the question of, of attention. Here was a, a theorem, an idea that people believed in very strongly. Casually, it doesn't seem as if it's right. Well, actually, for uh, this is a, what you might call the deductive aspect of economics. Economists ask the following question. What are the assumptions under which the conclusion that the pursuit of self-interest, profit maximization, would lead to efficient outcomes? And what are the conditions under which it would not? And actually, uh, before the crisis, uh, economists have provided a pretty complete answer to that question. Uh, in the 50s, uh, a couple economists, uh, Ken Arrow, Stanford, a brilliant economist, uh, investigated this question. And the kinds of things, some of these are sort of obvious. When, uh, when there are externalities, like environmental externalities, you don't get efficiency. Firms don't have an incentive not to pollute. And so there, the pursuit of private interest is to pollute, because nobody's charging you for it. It costs you something not to pollute. The, you bear the cost of not polluting, and the other people bear the cost of pollution. So, and, so Doctor, you're, what you're saying with, when you talk about externalities, and, and I would imagine you, you mentioned in your book as well, agencies, that, uh, that these are items that keep markets from being uh, perfect or self-regulating. Uh, is that, is that, that that's right, and and that when those occur, the the market is not efficient. Now, the critical my own work on this actually showed that Adam Smith's uh, conclusion. Uh, let me put it in a slightly different way. What, what, what uh, my own work showed what, that was that the reason the invisible hand often seemed invisible was that it wasn't there. Uh, <laughs> That is to say, is it, is it, is it there or isn't it? That whenever there is imperfect information, as an example, which is always, <laughs> markets don't work as well. Right. And yeah. and so, uh, uh, well before the crisis, we understood that the doctrine of markets working efficiently had to totally been undermined, and yet, many people kill, continue to believe in that free market religion. You point out in your book that the free marketeers or the market fundamentalists appear to have won at least the political day when, when Reagan and Thatcher came into office. And so what I would, I, I'd be interested in, in your thoughts there, and maybe you can expound a little bit about that. And also, wasn't it also the case that free markets keep the government out of it is also uniquely attractive to the business community? 
So, so uh, the battle is a battle that has raged on in no, a number of different contexts among <clears throat> academics, in the political sphere. And the interesting thing was exactly at the same time that Thatcher and Reagan were winning the battle in this political sphere, they were losing it in the intellectual sphere. The theorems I talked about, these results that markets in general are not efficient and stable. Uh, they just ignored that. If you wanted to give them uh, uh, the benefit of the doubt, what you, what you could say is the argument today is very clear. Markets by themselves are not efficient. The argument is now being reframed, but government is also inefficient. So it's not that markets, the old view was that markets have all these wonders, just keep the private sector government out. Now we know that that's not true. But the question is, the markets have all these blemishes, but government has more blemishes. So it's a comparative ugliness kind of uh, 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 context. But that's a very different intellectual argument. That's really making a statement that based on history, on average, government messes up more. Now, once you go into that realm, then there are, there are two questions you ask. Is it inevitable that government messes up? On average, of course, everybody makes a mistake. I mean, the private sector made a huge mistake. Uh, no government has ever wasted money on the scale that America's financial sector has wasted money. So, you know, in the last battle, the private sector won the battle about inefficiency, hands down. But the government could win the next battle. I, I don't give, uh, but the, 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 the uh, so from this, it's not inevitable that the government is inefficient. And you look around the world, and what you see is quite remarkable. The most successful countries in terms of economic growth have had a large role for government, large but circumscribed. So you look at the United States, what was the most important innovation that has really transformed our economy? It was the internet. And we don't have to say who invented the internet, but what we can say is that the government provided a large fraction of the finance for the, the internet. Biotech is another big thing. Um, most of the innovations, I mean, when, when, when we go down, uh, even the, the first uh, internet browser was financed by the US government. You know, you, you just, you, one doesn't really appreciate the role the basic science financed by government has had in transforming our lives. Now, sure. the private sector has done a good job in most cases of bringing those ideas to market. And that's a kind of an example of a division of responsibility. So uh, where, where it's worked uh, in general. But the notion that markets by themselves would solve those problems is just wrong. There is this uh, discussion of smaller role for government. Government needs to be reduced. What, what does your yeah. theory tell you about that? So to me, it's, it's uh, not the question so much of size as the question of what it does and how it does it. So, for instance, the government should have taken a more active role in regulating the financial institutions, stopping the bubble. Um, that doesn't mean that it needed to be necessarily more in intrusive. So I, for instance, I, 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 when I was in the Clinton administration, I opposed the repeal of Glass-Steagall. And I could say, you know, mild accomplishment. It didn't happen as long as I was there, but there were other forces that were probably more relevant. But it was a very intense battle that we faced. You know, and, and you look at the arguments that I was putting forward, all the fears that I expressed turned out to be real fears. So that's a simple regulation that says that we ought to separate out the kind of banks that take ordinary people's money and you want to be conservative, and the kind of banks that take rich people's money and want to be aggressive and finding good opportunities. The two different business models, bringing them together right. is risky. Right. So, that's not a complicated regulation to, to write, and yet it's not intrusive, but it's very effective. So uh, it, it, that's an example where it's not the size of the government, but, but what it does and- uh, Doing and, it maybe smartly or- uh, Exactly, I mean, another example where when I was uh, in the, the, um, 
the Clinton administration, one of the things that we changed, an example where we stripped away a regulation, at one point there was a regulation that uh, every branch of a bank had to be registered. And then they made a little mistake and they decided that every, TM, every ATM machine was treated as if it were a bank. <laughs> of course, what that did is generate a huge amount of paperwork. And, you know, the main cost was environmental because you developed computers that would fill out the forms. The forms would be sent to the bottom of some basement. Uh, so the main cost was not that great because, because it was all automatic, automatic the trees suffered. Uh, but it didn't do any good. So we said, this is an absurd regulation, and we got rid of it. Uh, so th you have to be careful. You know, what are regulations that actually protect you? And regulations that say that banks shouldn't be in the gambling business, to me, seem to me uh, a simple regulation uh, that makes a lot of sense. But it's been very difficult to get uh, of regulation, that's you know the 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 CDSs, the kinds of the, the, the these derivative products, um, they may or may not be useful. They may or may not be they may be insurance products or gambling products, but they're not lending. Right. And so, why should an FDIC government insured institution be involved in issuing them? Yeah. Why should we be underwriting that kind of risky product? Uh, and to me, that seems to me a, a very simple principle, not hard to enforce, but uh, we've had a hard time to get that regulation adopted. Right. You said that there were no mortgages that were created by the, uh, the banking system during this period that were actually good for homeowners. Uh, and, and you cited Denmark, I think. Uh, you, know, you said, you know, look, there's, you, can, you can create a mortgage product that deals with people losing jobs, that deals with uh, you know, hard times and, and keeps people in their homes. But that was never done. Instead, you know, the, the emphasis was on fee generations and creating situations that created different ways to make more revenues by, uh, by banks. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly the point, that, that the incentive structures got distorted. So, and it got worse in some ways with securitization. And one way to think about this is that in the old model of banking, a bank would originate the mortgage. It then kept the mortgage. And if the mortgage went bad, the bank would lose money. So there was a sense of accountability. And with securitization, the new model was based on what I call uh, uh, a fool is born every minute theory. Uh, that uh, we, uh, with securitization, you originated the mortgage and you asked, can I find some fool around the world that'll buy this mortgage? And if you could, then you didn't care about whether it went, whether it got paid back. All you got cared about was the fee you got when you originated the mortgage. And then we, we developed, you might say, a whole industry. The mortgage originators originated the mortgage. Uh, the investment banks packaged the mortgage, and then the rating agencies believed in financial alchemy. They could take an F-rated mortgage, bless it, and convert it into an A-rated product. I mean, it was better than alchemy of the Middle Ages, where you took lead and converted it into gold. This was real money that they created by this blessing. And then people in Europe and elsewhere assumed that America is a good country, honest people. Uh, they don't believe that anymore. And uh, bought these mortgages. When I give a talk in Europe, I always thank the audience for having bought so many of our mortgages. They bought about 40% of it. Just think about that. If they hadn't done that, the downturn in the United States, the problem in our banking system, would have been that much worse. So, uh, uh, and so uh, the, 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 the result of this was we, we developed uh, mortgages that were focused on fee extraction. So you wanted people to roll over their mortgages. You told them uh, balloon mortgages, you know, after five years you have to reissue the mortgage. Uh, a whole set of products that when you think about it, 
we're crazy. We developed something, you know, this was innovation, something called liar mortgages. No doc mortgages. Uh, so uh, you could manufacture them quickly and sell them. So it was an efficient uh, production. But a little detail, you didn't look at whether they could repay the mortgage. You didn't care because that was not the objective. Well, it, it, it was assumed the, uh, the housing prices would continue to go up, right? Ex exactly. So no one would ever have to worry about that. Yeah, but you, you knew that, that they should have known. These financial wizards should have known because, after all, incomes in the United States were stagnant. I mean, at the bottom and the middle. You know, all the increase in income in the United States has gone at the top. Uh, the data that came out a couple of weeks ago showed that median income, people in the middle in the United States now is lower than it was in 1997. So we've had, you know, we, so incomes were stagnant and going down, house prices were soaring. You know, you don't have to have a PhD to know that you can't spend more than 100% of your income in housing. You know, that's just, uh, but, you know, so this couldn't continue. And, and, and so it was just a, a, a matter of time before the day of reckoning came. As long as interest rates were low at one, two, three percent, the system wor was working. But the moment interest rates started to soar, you were, go you were going, going to hit a wall. And interest rates, uh, Greenspan and, and brought interest rates down to a very low level, historically unusual. And it, 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 to me, it was obvious that at some point they would start ri rising when they did this system was going to all fall apart because then people couldn't afford it, they would have to start selling, and the bubble would then come crashing down. And, and that's what happened. So then we, we move forward and we have a situation where we've got, uh, uh, we, we had the tech bubble in the U.S., and that also burst, and then we had the housing bubble. So we're, we're, are we doomed to have bubbles, uh, you know, as, as a matter of life and course? No, we're not doomed, but if you have a Fed that doesn't understand what it's doing, uh, you have the risk of going from bubble to bubble because the solution to every mistake is to repeat the previous mistake in a different form. So uh, I think one of the concerns right now is that uh, the low interest rates and moving into quantitative easing is uh, creating another series of bubbles or threatens to do that. So uh, if you had, what, the way monetary policy is supposed to work, I mean, is that the uh, cheaper money, uh, more availability of money, translates into more lending, more lending translates into People buying more machines, so their debts go up, but so are their assets. And so you have a stronger economy and a more dynamic economy, and uh, that's what's supposed to happen. Now, that's not what happened in 2001, because then we had, we brought interest rates down to a really record low, but rather than getting investment to start, what did we do? We started the housing bubble, and that meant people could consume. So what we did is we created debt, but we didn't create an asset like what you do when you encourage investment. So that's part of the problem now. We created a legacy. We, we created a, 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 a legacy of leverage of debt without the asset, and that's one of the reasons we're going to have such a hard time recovering. We weren't making the economy stronger. The Fed didn't notice that. <laughs> I mean, remarkably, it felt good because it had created the tech bubble. It solved the tech bubble, quote unquote, by creating the housing bubble. But as I said, uh, those of us who saw this said, this is, this is insane. Now, the new money isn't, again, isn't working the way it's supposed to. It's supposed to lead to more lending for small and medium-sized enterprises, for instance, to the banking system. But we didn't repair our banking system. Our banking system is still not lending. Yeah, we gave it a lot of money, and they took that money and gave it to bonuses, and uh, paid it out in dividends, and you know, did all kinds of other things. But when Obama and Bush said they wanted to give money to the banks, remember they said they didn't do it because they loved the banks, but because they needed to do it to resuscitate the economy. 
the presumption was that that money would translate into lending. That was always the justification. Didn't do it. Didn't do it because they didn't put any either incentives or constraints. Economists believe in incentives. If you don't give incentives and constraints, they're going to do what's in their interest. And what's in their interest, not to lend. So the, if the money isn't going into lending, where is it going? Well, it's looking for the best opportunity in the world, which is the next bubble. <laughs> and our guys are very ingenu ingenious. Uh, you know, the, the, we have a world, we have a world Marketplace is it, is it out gold? There. Is it commodities? Uh, we, you know, it, or bonds? Or bonds? Okay. Bonds? Bond prices going up? So it, there are lots of possibility. But one of the consequences that we're facing right now is that many of these potential uh, places where the money is going are foreign countries, the successful foreign countries, the emerging markets. But the emerging markets are saying. No, thank you. You know, our economy is doing fine right now. Uh, we don't want this surge of short-term money that comes in and then goes out. We saw what happened in 97, 98 in the East Asia. We don't want you. Thank you. Uh, but keep it. But in the old rules of the game, there was nothing they could do. But they said, we're not going to play by those old rules. So what are they doing? They're taxing this inflow. They're, they're putting capital controls and they're intervening in exchange rates. And that's so, get, so get pro capital protectionism. Well, it's give it, that, it depends on what you call it. They're saying we're just protecting ourselves because you're trying to protect yourselves by getting your exchange rate down, our exchange rate, you, you know, your, our exchange rate up. Uh, we'll allow a little adjustment, but we won't allow this bubble. We won't allow you to destroy our economy. That's very and interesting. So, you know, they said enough is enough. We've, we've let our exchange rate, Brazil had exchange rate go up, way up. But when the threat of quantitative easing and the money started rushing in, they said, hold it. We, this is bad for us. And they're making a valid point. It's going to be bad for you because we are the strength of the global economy right now. If our economy starts to dysfunction, you know, if we, if we can't export, if we can't, if, if, if these bubbles kill a lot of our firms, you, you know, get the distortions that distorted your economy, we can't afford it, first of all. You know, you're a rich country. You can afford making mega mistakes. We can't afford mega mistakes. And if our firms, uh, and, and, and if, if, if uh, we don't manage our economy, we're the only source of global growth right now, and if we do badly, you're going to do badly. So it's in your interest that we manage our economy better than you managed your economy. <laughs> Sounds like a good argument. What, uh, Dr. Seaglis, what, what would you have done? You've, you've been, uh, in, in the book, you're, you're very precise and uh, uh, fairly critical uh, of both the Bush and the Obama administrations about the, the, uh, the solutions that they took to the uh, financial crisis. Uh, you didn't like the, the stimulus in your mind wasn't uh, large enough. Uh, the uh, TARP program had, uh, had flaws because, as you said a few minutes ago, it didn't spur lending. Um, and I think you, were, you, you even had a more fundamental criticism. You, you, you said that there was not a vision of what we were trying to do, what, what the end result of the, um, of the system uh, would be at the end of all of this. Now let me let me comment on that vision thing. Um, the 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 uh, there were two views of what had happened. Many of the financial markets and many of those who would help the deregulation and create the problem wanted to the way they put it. There was an accident. You know, uh, who could have done anything about it? Accidents happen. And uh, so their view is this is a tsunami, a once in a hundred year flood. We were responsible and something happened to us. Uh, my view is it was something that they did to us and it wasn't, you know, they created it. So it was man-made. It's not a, a, an act of nature. It was, it was a, a, a creation of man. If your view is that it was 
an act of nature, an accident, what do you do? You, uh, the banks have been injured badly. You put them in the hospital, you repair them. Meanwhile, while the banks are in the hospital, you get a rent-a-car. <laughs> uh, you use the government stimulus to keep, to, to, to fill in for the gap. And in 18 months, 24 months, the banks are out of the hospital and we're ready to go back to 2007, uh, pedal to the floor, okay? So that's the image of, of what was going to happen. So you needed a short-term palliative to fill in for the banking, while the banking system was in the repair shop. Okay? So that was their model. My view was problems were deeper that before the crisis, the economy had been not functioning well. We had actually been supported by a distorted uh, system that we had uh, had this bubble, that, that it was a series of bubbles that had kept the economy going. It was a sick economy before that. And the result of it, it was even a sicker because we have a legacy of debt and a legacy of excessive investment in real estate. We, in a sense, borrowed from the future in both senses. We did an investment that we would have done in the future, we did it now, and we were burdening the American households with this huge legacy of debt. So if we had gone back to 2007, in a sense, we, we, we couldn't go back because we had these burdens, but the economy was sick in 2007, and our financial system was sick. It was obviously not functioned well, it wasn't just that it lost money, it was, its model was wrong, its business model was wrong. And so uh, we had to rethink our financial sector. We had lost the balance in so many different ways between the government and the role of regulation and so forth. So, so in my mind, we had to really rethink how to reconstruct a banking system, a financial system that went back to the basics and do what it was supposed to do. Uh, and, um, so that was really the debate. And I think now we know the answer to that, that the banking system has not been perfectly uh, healed, but uh, it's returned to profits, but the economy has not returned to health. So repairing the banking system was not enough. And repairing the banking system hasn't really repaired the mission, the vision. It's a more concentrated banking system, but it's still not lending to small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, we, to give, give you another example, uh, a very large fraction of, of lending had gone through the securitization model. I mentioned that before. That model was broken in the context of uh, housing. And yet there's no alternative. So you're talking before about what should the government be doing. Uh, it was interesting, it was a couple of meetings, uh, the White House brought everybody from the real estate sector down, and here were, and from the financial sector down. Here are people who normally believe that the government should stay out of everything, okay? What were they saying? Don't leave us. <laughs> keep in the real estate sector, keep in uh, supporting the mortgage market. Is there any philosophical argument for why this huge part of the economy should be in the public sphere? This is one of the areas which normally would be very appropriate for the private because for the government to be involved in the millions and millions of decision of who is a good person to lend to is exactly the sort of thing you don't want the government to do. And yet they're calling for the government to stay active. And uh, ironic. ironic, and the government right now, I mo many people may not realize that almost all the mortgages are now being bought by the Federal Reserve Board. The Go Federal Reserve Board now owns $1.2 trillion of your mortgages. And uh, many of them bad. And, well, and, and the trick was they got Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to take on the risk of default. So the Fed officially could say, oh, well, these are safe products now. The critics of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac can say, look at, they're doing so badly. Well, that was because after they were 
taken on to the government. We forced them to, we, it was part of our way of bailing out the banks because what we did in effect was take a lot of, we structured the mortgage, we, we, we took off a lot of the mortgages and moved them to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac as, as people paid back uh, money and took out new mortgages uh, under more favorable terms. Fannie and Freddie didn't create the uh, subprime uh, problem, right? They were sort of latecomers. They were latecomers into the into the actual purchasing. So they did. They made the mistake, if, if there was a mistake here, uh, of purchasing those bad assets. But uh, they did perhaps the rest of the banking sector a favor by taking those on. But let's, but let's go back to uh, the, the original um, question of a few minutes ago. So. Um, so instead of putting the banks in, a, in the hospital for 18 months, uh, you see uh, that there is a fundamental, the economy's broken. So apparently you're, you were looking, uh, and, and you've written this way, uh, for more fundamental structuring, restructuring, and, and, uh, and, and essentially giving some tough medicine to the uh, sector. But, but that's tough to do, isn't it, politically? Yeah. Right? Well, let me, two things. First, because I think that recovery is going to take a lot longer than 18 months. That's obvious by now. That means the government's going to need to come in with a stimulus that was much bigger, longer duration than they envisaged. And uh, that's why I've called for a second stimulus. But one of the things I say in my book is, which I said in the book, is I said there's a very big risk of the stimulus, which is too small, not well enough designed, that when it comes to an end, you're going to find it very difficult to get that second round of stimulus that you need. And that's where, really, where we are now. So this is what we need. Some people say, can we afford it? I would put it the other way. I don't think we can afford not to do it. But unfortunately, we probably won't do it. And that means that the recovery is going to be delayed, it's going to be take longer, and we risk moving to a new normal in which unemployment is for a long time in much higher, you know, kinds of things you used to see in Europe, seven, eight, nine percent for years, rather than the 4.2 percent that we got uh, in the 90s. So the banks uh, were in this huge problem as a result of the bubble. Uh, the administration carried out or continued mostly the, 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 um, the program of the uh, prior Bush administration and uh, uh, looked for a way of injecting liquidity, right, uh, with the intention that this would bring the banks somehow over the problem. They wouldn't have to take losses right now and, go through all that problem of, of declaring large losses, and um, that the banks would somehow, as a result of the injection of, of uh, new capital, would start making loans. That didn't happen. That's right. What would you have done? Well, uh, there, there are, are uh, two things I would have done. Uh, the first is, uh, it goes back to what you said, is what is the vision of what a financial sector is supposed to do and it does many different things, and different parks do different things, but where was the real critical problem was lending. So, and then you ask which of our financial institutions are mostly involved in that, and that's largely small and medium-sized banks, community banks, uh, and uh, we didn't direct much of our money of the TARP to that. The result of that is uh, 140 of those banks went bankrupt last year. More are likely to go bankrupt this year. Problems are getting worse. 800, more than 800 are on the watch list. This is the tip of the iceberg, but not surprisingly, that, that's a problem. And so uh, uh, I would have directed more of my attention to that part of the financial system. Uh, secondly, I would have uh, try to provide carrots and sticks to try to encourage lending. When I say carrots and sticks, I mean things like uh, 
discouraging the banks from making money by writing credit default swaps. Th that these non-lending activities are more attractive. Uh, sure. That doesn't help our economy. So uh, just things like if you're going to get money access to the Fed window, you have to play. You have to play, play your role in getting the economy uh, started again. So there were a number of things that we could have done to reorient our banking system, at least a part of our banking system, to go back to boring banking. And so that would have been part so, of my vision. And so, then the third. So, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay. The third thing is <clears throat> uh, links to the other thing we haven't talked about, which is the mortgage market. One of the things, you know, the, the, where the whole problem began, and um, our major strategy is something I call muddling through. Uh, try not to deal with the reality that there was a bubble and that the bubble broke, and that meant there are a lot of bad mortgages. One out of four mortgages are underwater. And so rather than dealing with the reality, what did we do? We changed the accounting standards to make it easier for them not to recognize the losses. So we gave them an incentive not to restructure, because when they restructure the mortgages, they have to recognize the losses. So while we were telling them, you have to restructure, we want you to restructure, we were giving them incentives not to restructure. You know, it made no sense. It was, it was really, it made no sense. Except politically it makes sense, because many of the banks did not want to face the reality and the administration didn't want to face the reality. If they had to recognize the losses, they'd have to get more capital. And capital might have been difficult to get. It might have had to come from the government. And uh, that was ideologically an anathema. But other market economies have handled this perfectly easily. You know, some people call this, uh, you know, you, you put money in uh, and then when the economy recovers, you sell the, 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 the government shares. You make a profit. Uh, you know, this, this has happened before. US, U.S. has done it. Other countries have done it. It's not a big deal. But we made a, we made a fetish out of this. And so uh, because we didn't want to put, uh, we, we worried about uh, this recapitalization, we didn't want to deal with the losses, and so we've not dealt with the, the losses, which has meant that the homeowners, we haven't dealt with the homeowners. And so in a way, one way I, I've described this is we, we believe to hope in some version of trickle-down economics. Give enough money to the banks and somehow the benefits would trickle down to the average American. Hasn't worked that way. And if you ask what, and this, and again, I talk about this in the book, it wasn't likely to work that way. And I expressed the fear in the book that if it didn't work that way, it would generate a lot of disillusionment with the way our society functions, because it would be viewed as unfair. And if most citizens think the, uh, the system is unfair, uh, our society can't work. You know, we, we have a democratic, consensual society that really rests on, on a, a broad sense that our system is not perfectly, but broadly fair. And I think that's been broken. No, it's, it's, um, it, it's an interesting dilemma with an administration having to balance all of these things uh, and taking on, you know, to, to have done, to have given the, the, the harsh medicine that you're talking about, restructuring, letting certain banks fail, I suppose, uh, would have meant taking on uh, a very strong uh, economic group and I'm not saying, you know, I'm, I'm not passing judgment on it, just, just uh, commenting that it's, it's, it seems to be, uh, to be a very difficult yeah. thing to do. Let me just try to correct something, though. A lot of what I'm talking about is not letting the banks fail. It's letting the usual rules of capitalism operate, which means the shareholders lose, the bank officers have to go, and the bondholders have to lose. So in many of these processes, the banks keep going, the depositors get protected. We have deposit insurance, so that will continue. It's really the question of accountability of the shareholders. They reap the profits when things were good. Do they share in the losses when things go bad? And what we said, in effect, was we bailed out shareholders 
when things went bad. And that's really a different kind of capitalism. And, and from the point of view of, of, of anybody who believes in market economics, this is distorted. And when you have distortions of this magnitude, you're not going to get economic efficiency. So it's not just a question even of equity. It's really a question of also of efficiency. Back to economic theory. Well, let's, uh, let's take some questions. Sir? Uh, Dr. Stiglitz, uh, I'd be interested in your uh, assessment of the uh, financial reforms that passed a few weeks ago. I think the, the bill that got passed, as I say in the afterword to my book, is stronger than I anticipated, but far less than we need. Uh, it, and it's a little bit like, say, it's like a smelly Swiss cheese. It has some very good elements in it, but lots of holes. And uh, for every principle that's recognized, there are exceptions and exemptions that make no philosophical sense, no economic sense, but are understandable from the politics. Let me give you an example that we recognize the importance of consumer protection. But then we give a big exemption for auto bill loans, which are the second biggest category of loans. Now, why in the world should you allow fraudulent, predatory auto bill loans where you don't want, you know, is there something about that? It's, it's really good to have fraud and predatory behavior in that area? Sports. What? It's part of the sport of buying a car. Car. I, so you, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it may be that it's, it's what Americans love is, you know, you go, you, 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 you want to outsmart the dealer to figure out the, you not only you have to figure out the car, you have to figure out the mortgage, pro the, the, uh, the, the loan product. <laughs> well, uh, I've already talked about, for instance, recognizing the principle in a way that the banks ought not to be engaged in uh, these excessive risk taking, but then again, a lot of exceptions. Um, the one thing they didn't attack in any way seriously was the too big to fail problem. And the problem too big to fail uh, has gotten worse because uh, we merged banks, we let, let them bigger, got bigger. And I think Mervyn King, who was the uh, governor of the Central Bank of England, Bank of England, uh, put it uh, absolutely right when he said, if you're too big to fail, you're too big to be. And Paul Volcker pointed out, if you're too big to fail, you're all probably also too big to be managed. And uh, so, uh, there's very little evidence of what we call economies of scale and scope that would justify uh, these too big to fail. What we did is we had some stuff what they called resolution authority, living wills. We know that in the last crisis, we blinked. We didn't use all of the authorities that we had because if we had let the shareholders lose everything, the, they were told, the government was told, it would lead to chaos. That was nonsense. But if you're a government official, you don't, you, you, you don't want to have it on your shoulders that the global financial system collapsed. We will blink again. And so we have not really dealt with the problem of too big to fail, too interconnected to fail, uh, too correlated to fail. Uh, and so uh, it was a move in the right direction, but just, just not enough. Um, and that, to me, is, is filling in the holes and doing that are the two big uh, gaps. Um, the politi politics uh, is that uh, it's going to be increasingly difficult if, if the forecast of what happens turn out to be the case to either get the regulatory structure or the stimulus that we need. And uh, the result of that is, uh, I, I, you know, uh, I'm glad I'm not giving this as an after dinner talk because that would give you indigestion. Uh, <laughs> the fact is that, uh, the prospects for, for the country are, are really very pessimistic, I think, right now. And um, you asked a question a little bit before about global competitiveness in the financial sector. Well. You know, there's, there, there's a broader sense of global competitiveness of our whole economy. And the emerging markets, by and large, have gotten better than we have. And they're going very well. And uh, in a large number of ways, our influence in the rest of the world will be diminished because 
our economic model, which was our source of soft power strength, uh, has been really uh, shown not to be what many people thought it was. Uh, Dr. Stieglitz, how do you see uh, the war of currencies, as uh, Dominic Strauss-Kahn put it last week, affects or challenges the U.S., the recovery of the U.S. economy? The currency war, as it's called, is a war like most wars in which there are no winners. Uh, we're trying to get a competitive devaluation, bigger than neighbor policy. But what we should have learned is that's very hard because we can only succeed if other countries allow us to succeed. And they're saying, we'll allow you a little bit, but not too much. And uh, we've, we've, we're reaching the end of their willingness to, to let this flood of money coming in. And so the consequence is that they, they are, as I said before, uh, imposing taxes, capital controls, exchange rate interventions, all of which is leading to a more fragmented global financial market and a finan global financial market that is more unstable. The net effect of that is that greater instability is bad for investment, bad for recovery. What I think we ought to uh, be doing is, as I said before, get our economy to grow internally rather than trying to use beggar their neighbor policies. If our economy is growing more rapidly, then countries like China will feel more comfortable about allowing their exchange rate to appreciate. Because now what they say is that they let their exchange rate appreciate and the global economy is so weak, their firms are going to face a real, diff real difficulty and, and their responsibility is to looking after their citizens. And uh, the instability of global financial, of global markets brought because of the US mismanagement, uh, they, can't, they have to manage that. And so if we had growth, I think you would get realignment. But realignment won't lead to growth. So one has to get the sequencing right. Realignment, uh, uh, you know, small gradual realignment would be helpful. But any large change is not going to uh, uh, be achieved, I think, without more robust growth. Uh so it's, it is time to wrap it up, and uh, Dr. Stieglitz, uh, I, I can't tell you how thankful you know, the World Affairs Council is for your participation. Uh, congratulations on your uh, tour de force and your book and, um, and, and, and having the courage to, to tell it uh, like you think it is. And uh, we, we, we enjoyed uh, your sharing your views and thoughts today. Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Stay connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.